Hi, and welcome to Rethink Dialogue. In today's episode, we're going to meet uh, Gemma Craven, who is the Executive Vice President at Social at Ogilvy in New York. Let's go and find out what she has to say about social business marketing. Hi, Gemma. Hi, Ant. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Thank you. (laughs) Welcome to Norway. Thank you for inviting me to Norway. I'm very excited to be here. I had to. Finally. Yes. <laughs> um, so um, we know known each other for a while, but mm-hmm. I know the viewers haven't the same um, knowledge as mm-hmm. I do. So, so tell me a little bit about yourself and your job. So um, I head up the New York uh, division of Social at Ogilvy. Ogilvy, if you haven't heard of Ogilvy, is the world's. I think it's the world's largest. It's advertising the biggest. Agency. It is. Okay, let me go. Um, <laughs> if you haven't heard of David Ogilvy, you should probably go and read one of his books, Ogilvy on Advertising. He's one of the founders of the medium as we know it. Um, yeah. And I joined Ogilvy three years ago to really grow the social practice in the New York office. Mm-hmm. Now, what that means is taking social media and spreading it across all of the Ogilvy functions. So mm-hmm. everything from PR and marketing to advertising, CRM. Um, production, really anywhere that a customer would connect with Ogilvy because we have various different offerings. It's about integrating social in the right way so that it's at the core of everything we do rather than a layer just slapped on the top. Cool. Mm -hmm. Because Ogilvy was, I guess, as many others, a traditional agency. Yes. Um, (laughs) Interesting because I think we've been on a journey of transformation over the past 12 to 18 months. So from the outside point of view, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. And the, the social started with digital. Mm. Um, we did have a digital Ogilvy offering that is now, again, a part of everything we do. We don't have it as a separate um, standalone anymore. And Social at Ogilvy was founded in a similar way as to mm. infuse social media across the agency. I honestly think in two, one, two years, we might not even have it as a standalone practice, which yeah. hopefully I'll have another role by then. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's really the goal is to make it at the core of everything rather than it being an afterthought or... Um, you know, I really try and educate people on how social media works, mm. understanding how people engage with each other, sort of the, the science of, and practice of influence, because yeah. again, I think that's often missed and it's a core part of, of the, 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 the medium. Yeah, because um, so here, not to say anything bad about advertising here in Norway, but still, social is kind of new still. Right. So it's, it's often seen upon as something that is on the side of the marketing mix. Mm-hmm. Um, is that the same in the US or have it moved forward and it's more like, oh, we also have to? Right. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think there are different stages of mm. um, evolution and we kind of plotted a graph of where the industry is at in the mm. US. And it goes from kind of this nervous ambivalence of like, oh, I don't know what it is, I'm just not going to touch it, to this row fully integrated social from the top down. Yeah. I'd actually say, um, you know, I always cite Ford as a company, as a brand that's really embraced social media from the top and it's integrated through all they do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for the most part, companies are in the middle. They're going from kind of these unconnected experiments, most, mostly on Facebook, to mm-hmm. a more kind of integrated approach with a strategy. Um, mm. But it really varies. I mean, yeah. there's some real market leaders. There's other companies that just think, like I said, they don't know what to do and they're going to leave it alone. But most, I think, in the last year, I've seen are really at that midway point. Cool. Um, and when it comes to, so again, advertising has been known for doing TV. And the way new media has entered the right. stage, uh, suddenly things are happening that is so, so cool. Like Netflix with the... With the what is it called again? The 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 deck of no stack House of, of cards. House of cards. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where they tapped into what people were looking at first, mm-hmm. influencers, and then actually shaping. Oh, they look mostly at Kevin Spacey when right. they look at other things, and right. then let's put him on lead. Yeah. Uh, so, what's your, your your thoughts on that when it comes to advertising, looking at TV, and then implementing it and doing activation through social? Yeah. So I think. Um, it's really interesting because I think it's changed. Um, really, those brands who understand that mm. they get immediate feedback and they can really build on that are the ones that succeed. It's no longer, here's our spot, you're, you're going to like it. Um, it's a much more agile world. Mm. Um, and I, that's been an interesting, again, trying to help brands understand that you can't just put something out and then leave it. You have to have a plan for follow up and listening and then capturing content from your fans and, and really using that. Um, so, you know, a couple of really interesting kind of I call it um, terms, but Mm. movements, trends, (laughs) whatever word we want to use. Um, But things such as um, in the UK, 
a brand that I love, I think does a great job, is Whisper. So yeah. I don't know if you have Whisper here, but it's one of my favourite chocolate bars. Mm. It's got bubbles in it. <laughs> um, and they've really put fans at the heart of everything they do. So rather okay. than launching a new uh, product via an ad, at first they actually asked their fans to help them reveal the product. So they launched mm. a competition to find the biggest fan of Whisper. Okay. And it was the person that could get the most likes on Facebook around a post. They then brought her in and she was used in content to actually reveal the new product and then they ran the ads. Wow. So it's like, you know, reversing the exactly. cycle and it's very cool. Yeah. Um, another uh, brand that I love what they did mm. with this, again, it's out of the UK. Um, mm. <laughs> it was actually a company called Bodyform and they replied to a fan's comment on Facebook and it's like a fan, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> uh, like sanitary towels, okay? So it's not the most glamorous of topics, but... Somebody wrote a comment on their Facebook wall about how their advertising had been misleading for all these, these years. And so they created this kind of fake CEO who yeah. recorded a video, they posted it on YouTube, and then that was spread around. And it's like that's becoming the moment of connection. Mm. Um, and, of course, adverts are important. Um, Oreo is much discussed. They are doing a lot. I really think they're trying to push themselves as like at the heart of popular culture. Yeah. Um, at the Super Bowl, they had a big spot running around, like, is it cookie or cream? If you don't know what an Oreo is, it's two <laughs> well, chocolate biscuits with the cream in the middle. I didn't know until I moved to the States. Oh, you didn't? Oh, uh, no, but I do now. Yeah, they're, <laughs> if they're I really didn't popular. live in America, I would do now. Yeah. Um, and the most discussed piece of content from them, as we were talking about earlier, yeah. was a, an image that they put out, they created midway through the game because all the lights went off during yeah. the Super Bowl. Um, and it was the most discussed, the most shared, but it was also on the back of a big campaign that they were doing. So mm. TV spots do drive discussion. They, they haven't become less, less of that. They're just more part of a more nimble, wider mix. Mm. And I think that top-down approach has really changed. It's often starting at the grassroots level and thinking about what conversations are happening, how can we build on them, what are our fans saying, how can we bring our fans in and ask for their advice and opinion and, and shape content like you were saying with the House of Cards. Yeah, um, exactly. Example. Yeah, I, I also heard um, the, uh, a person from, from HBO uh, saying about how they actually took the readers of Game of, Throne, Game, mm -hmm. of Game of Thrones, activating them by sharing like snippets. Oh, this is how the sword is going to look like. This is the detail of the buckle. Right. All these kind of details that the nerds would really love to yes. know about and that other people just like, I don't care. Yeah. But by activating them in, in that way, they actually managed to transform them into fans of the series as well mm -hmm. because they were really negative and in it's, the beginning. Ah, interesting. So that's because uh, that's when you look back at influence and how you sort of influence and engage people. There's a guy called Robert Cialdini who wrote a whole book on the drivers of influence and yeah. he boils it down to six in the end and one of them is this kind of exclusivity mm. piece so if you're listening and you find someone that's negative against you per se if you say hey I've got this exclusive thing just for you mm -hmm. you as a person are going to feel special and be more inclined to share and talk to others about it so it's just a smart way of inviting people into the experience and it doesn't just have to be for media anymore because no. it used to be just journalists that got that kind of access <laughs> but now it's really changed and I think that's what's really amazing about technology and social media and how that's really changed what we do yeah every yeah day. yeah I talked a little bit to to Adam Oster about it when when um, for example now um, God, I'm bad with names. I'm sorry. The TV series that is now Veronica Mars. Yes. That is now it's funded through funded. Kickstarter. Yeah. Right. How cool. I mean, how, how fans just yes. activating and saying, we want the movie. Yeah. That's so cool. I know. And the whole Kickstarter phenomenon, really, yeah. where, you know, you can go out there and get, you can get funding for any type of project, whether it's like a watch that's got your little iPod in it, to mm. a movie, to the recording an album. I have many kind of creative friends who really use the platform very well. And it's just this okay. democratization of process that was so top down before. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think Kickstarter's amazing. And the Veronica Mars thing, they funded it in a matter of days, week, yeah, I think. Week, yeah. yeah, it was really not, not long at all. So that's, yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah I just, I'm just fascinated about the whole, how everything just changes. And, and it changed the world of advertising as well, because suddenly now we have the, the concept of native advertising. Right. Which is, so how would you define native advertising because it's a really new word here in Norway. Yeah, so um, native advertising is advertising that springs from the ground up. Again, mm. I think it's talking about putting conversations, fans, people at the heart of it. That's mm. how I would look at it. Mm. Um, you know, when we saw recently the New York Times is now offering, you can buy, like, display ads based on what's trending on mm. Twitter. Mm. And that's 
a very smart of the times to think about that but also a great way to capitalize on things people are talking about mm. um so say it was discussion around a sporting event you could then buy ads based on like trending topics on twitter so mm. it's like you're getting more effectiveness out of your ad dollar mm. um and the times is being more of a, a better partner to advertisers so mm. for me I, you know, again, I, I think you're right, it's a new term across the board, <laughs> but for me it's more about the ads are no longer, okay, this is it, we're going to pass it from the top. It's about how can we listen and involve people in advertising and then grow content around, around that, to mm. put out as a unit. Mm. Um, and when, when it comes to, to, let's bring back to social business mm -hmm. marketing, which it's a term that I'm passionate about. Right. Uh, so, so how do you think companies now are gonna approach the whole thing about social business marketing mm -hmm. because we're talking about social media it's, it's to many companies it's fluffy yes it's really like oh we're gonna engage with our fans but we cannot really right. cash in on mm -hmm. it so how how do you think that's gonna evolve in the next months because we're talking about months here. yeah no um so i think it's a, it's it's like behavioral change basically mm. for a business because it's not just about advertising and communications it's about how your employees communicate with each other how you innovate mm. um how you protect your reputation yes how you communicate externally so mm. i think you have to look at all of that mm. spectrum and think about how social media can be used and should be used so say you're a company with offices in Oslo, New York and London, you can use tools like Yammer, Facebook, Twitter to allow your employees to connect with each other and you mm. should encourage that. Mm -hmm. um, you can ask your fans, for example, about product innovation. You could maybe go, Starbucks does this really well. Like yeah. my Starbucks idea, I like ask them for their ideas and feedback and then take that and use that to innovate and create new products. Um, in terms of corporate reputation, it's important to connect with those external audiences but also to be listening for conversations that are happening about you mm. so that you can participate in them rather than letting them happen and there's crisis management but there's also just general you know brand reputation mm. um and then what was the fourth one <laughs> <laughs> i think you know I, I think um in terms of employees and what they expect i think mm. now employees expect to be able to connect with the CEO, um, whether they just ride the elevator with them or they can just follow them on Twitter and have this kind of one-on-one -on -one dialogue. So it's broken down a lot of silos. Um, yeah. And I just think taking a step back and thinking, like you said, it's not just a fluffy bit of marketing, but it's actually an intrinsic change in the way in which we as humans connect and communicate. And just rather than trying to avoid it, think mm. about, okay, how can we embrace it and make it right for our company mm. um, and our culture and how we communicate and connect internally and externally. So what do you think about CEOs and says that, no, we're not going to allow our, our employees to use Twitter and Facebook? They're going to do it anyway. <laughs> They've all got an iPhone, right? I know, and yeah. if you say no, then the nature of us as human beings is we're just going to go and do it anyway. Exactly. So again, why not participate and give them the guardrails to help them <laughs> than let them you know, mess up on their own? I think it's much more effective to be open. And again, I think that's it's like a social business is an open business. and sure there's content that they can't share and shouldn't share and mm. shouldn't even have access to and that's all about being you know open and saying okay these are the this is how we approach social media ibm's a great example of this yeah that's your client right yeah yeah it is then like, uh -huh. disclosure they are a <laughs> but i think they are a good example anyway um they they sort of several years ago said okay this is how we want you to use social media these are the guardrails mm. this is what you can and cannot say mm -hmm. but we empower you go out and you know, create your blogs grow a twitter following connect with influencers and actually it got to a point where they had to kind of scale it back a bit because it was so widely oh, used that wow. they had to sort of help people shape their approaches you know mm. it's not for everyone social media um another client we're working with is a soccer team coming over to the u.s okay. um, and they're all about growing their presence in pre the World Cup and really sort of galvanizing on the fact that soccer is becoming much more popular in the States. Mm. And we were talking to their coach and said, not everyone should be on Twitter. <laughs> it's not for everyone. And no. they've had some incidents where the media might have connected with players and it didn't go so well. So it's, I think the same applies to a company. It's yeah. just about helping people understand what's right and what's not right for them. Exactly. And, and find the, so if it's a platform that you're comfortable with and mm. embrace them and, and, and bring them forward. And mm -hmm. if someone is like, no, that's not for me, then like, okay, it's right. fine. It's right. okay. Yeah. Um, but um, if, if you want to give an advice to a startup entrepreneur, 
that is like he has a passion for his product he's going to start up with something but he yeah. doesn't really know where to start mm -hmm. so what's the first thing he does so um, I would say that one thing that I really love about this whole space and what it does is the fact that it does allow access to anyone mm. anywhere around the world exactly. and so if you have a product that you're passionate about there's going to be other people around the world that can help you a give you feedback b you're also probably passionate about a similar topic or theme mm. and c just kind of help you set your business up mm. um so we were at south by southwest together and yeah. i thought there was a lot more about helping entrepreneurs how to run a business rather than hey i've got the hot new products exactly, so yeah. i'd say just do some listening there's many tools you can use mm. um there's one called bottlenose that i love another one topsy it's all free yeah just like Type in keywords around what you do and see who else is talking about it and then just have a conversation with them. It's like walking into a cocktail party. <laughs> it's like you listen to see what which conversations are relevant to you and mm. then you can just join in. And I think that would be my first piece of advice because it's a big world out there and there's just there's so many smart people that you can connect to and, and really learn from. So I, I think that's what I find social has done for me. And I think particularly with any new business, it's an important mm. first step. I agree. Good one. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Um, so, what do you? Th so, as you mentioned, we were at South by. There was no new innovation presented, no. but I'm guessing there's coming something soon. So, what do you think is going to be the new, like, amazing? Yeah, thing? it's a great question because I just thought everything was kind of very future gazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, space. Everyone was talking about space travel, space exploration. Mm. Um, the reason I think there wasn't any product, big product launches there is I think we've seen people go to South by Southwest, launch these apps. They mm. kind of work okay when you're there, but then when you're back in the real world, it's yeah. got no relevance. It happened with Highlight last year, which if you don't know what it is, it's an app that shows you people who are nearby to you who have similar likes. So oh, okay. it might say if we were walking down the street, oh, aunt is nearby. He also likes Pepsi, I'm just hypothetically. <laughs> uh, he also likes Pepsi, bacon, and uh, Nike. You yeah. should connect. And while that was fine at a conference full of other interactive marketing professionals, in the real life, it's a bit yeah. creepy. And it also drained all the battery on your phone. It's just kind of had a few glitches. Oh, so right. it didn't stick. And no. I think that's why the, that whole conference has changed. Mm. Um, so it's really hard to say, though, what I think. What, something that really interested me at South by was this whole intersection between it's like this kind of contextual awareness. So mm. it's like the intersection between the social data we create, the locations we're in, the mm. devices we use, the clothes we wear. Yeah. So I think we're going to see this kind of smart fashion mm. evolve. I think that I'm excited about that. I think it's very cool. <laughs> so if you're an athlete, the top that you wear could log the the training that you've done and suggest food for you to eat and then you could walk up to your fridge which would also be a smart fridge and the devices would talk to each other and they'd say yeah. hey you should eat this aunt for lunch because you just did that and like that I think is a big yeah, kind of thing that's happening that's an awesome thing that I think big data is going to provide mm -hmm. uh, I was at this SOMO was presenting the machine to machine philosophy mm -hmm. And yeah, it's amazing it that is. if it's used in the proper way. Right. Again, it could be creepy. <laughs> exactly. And I think so, that's the kind of fine line, isn't it, between yeah. the robots are going to take over the world <laughs> to actually, no, we can just make ourselves smarter and better. And I think um, something like Fuel Band yeah. is, again, it's a great example of taking data that we generate and making people kind of compete against each other so that they can get fitter and they're more healthy. Mm. And that's, I think, really stuck. Yeah. Um, and I. There is definitely discussions around the creepiness of when you walk into a store, they know who you are. They'll say, OK, Ms. You know, Ms. Craven, you love to buy this. Here's mm. two of these extra. And I, I personally like that. Yeah. I'm all for it, quite frankly. But I think before the kind of the guy on the street accepts <laughs> that, I think we're a ways off. Again, yeah. I have to keep reminding myself is that we're in this kind of <laughs> bubble of like, we love it, but we're these... Maybe we're a bit nerdy. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> because I, I would love that as well. Mm. Just come into a store and it's like, oh, here's what you would like. Yes. Oh, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. And then I think, you know, something else that I really think is happening, and again, I saw it at South by, but it's ever more. I mean, we've been talking about Game mm. of Thrones and House of Cards and mm. the kind of the collision between entertainment, music, and digital and social media is, is upon us. And yeah. Adam may have talked to you about the Mashable House at South by Southwest, and they had a house where they actually brought internet memes to life. It's like, wow, that's how times have changed. Yeah. yeah, so they made 
yeah. the internet come to life. That's and it would have been the other way around, I think, yeah. many years ago. And it's just like it's made such a stamp on popular culture. And mm. I think this kind of mashup is going to continue, which is exciting. I think it's. A, I agree. It's a really interesting time. It's really cool when when you like you said you bring a memory to life. Yeah. And then the, the, the popularity was like amazing. Yeah, no, it was... Did you get a picture with him? No, I didn't. I wasn't <laughs> I didn't. prepared to line up. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Andrea was like, oh, please, I have no, to go. I, like, no, yeah. no. <laughs> I don't think I'm so. Look at it on Vine. <laughs> um, so, um, if there's um, any inspirational things, where, where do you find inspiration? Where do you stay up to date? Yeah, it's a really great question. So I find Tumblr to be an amazing source of inspiration. Yeah. I love it. It's such a creative community and you I can just go on a there. brain wander yeah. on Tumblr <laughs> and just sort of follow what people are following. I might be going on there to research something, but I try and just have a very like a loose time on there where I'll just follow what I want. Mm -hmm. um, I also um, try and read books by people that I'm inspired by and um, one a guy that I love is a guy called Austin Cleon mm -hmm. Cleon Cleon anyway he wrote a book about creativity and how to maintain it and okay. I find that space is where I get inspiration mm. uh, one of my favorites was actually at South by Southwest Tina Roth Eisenberg she's called Swiss Miss ah. she's a de she's a designer and she's just all about driving creativity in your own world mm. and another final favorite one is uh, brain pickings which it's more oh, yeah. long form writing, but it's lovely. There's so many different books that the curator of it, um, Maria Popova, shares, and I just I find a lot of inspiration there. So mm. I try and combine like the written word with visual sort of just stuff that people share. Yeah. Um, I also think it's important to stay up to date with what's happening in the industry. Yeah. Um, not because I want to copy what others are doing but I know that my clients will come and say oh we saw you know Starbucks did this we want to do it and you have to kind of be one step ahead of that kind of thing yeah. in, in our space I yeah, think. because that's that's even more creepy that clients actually are a lot more up-to-date than Very what they used so. to be. It's been a huge change yeah. and we've actually seen it as an agency lots of clients start to hire mm our people to go in house mm. and so you're then you're working with a peer and it was before it was much the agency was the authority and mm. again I think in the how agencies are redefining themselves is interesting because you know, you're working with people that are smarter than you not that clients aren't smart but it's just we were in such a new space we were yeah. the innovators and as it evolves I think that's going to continue to change mm. so um, you know things that how you can be beneficial is helping clients innovate and being very agile and helping them sort of execute on something that they might not have resources in-house. It's just rethinking the relationship, mm. which is, I think, I think is cool. And yeah. that's how I like to work anyway, but I'm, I'm not sure everyone likes that. <laughs> <laughs> you Shall never we know. say? You never know. <laughs> exactly. Um, wow. I think I, you, you, you answer amazingly. I like that. I oh, love that. Thanks. Um, so the team. So just to, to end up with... Uh, your working day. So yes. how big is the team that you're actually handling now? So I have 17 people that work for me mm. in New York. Um, we've got 500 plus social at Ogilvy people globally. Mm. Um, it's grown, the thing I love is it's grown from two people when I started three years ago to this current size. Wow. So yeah. um, there are others in the agency that work underneath social at Ogilvy, but they're not my direct report. So mm. say there's about 50 of us in the New York office. Mm. Um, so yeah, we you know, they work on clients like IBM, Nestle, IKEA, BP, um, some Ford work. So really the kind of very big clients, mm. um, we call them GBMs at Ogilvy, which means global business marketing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Okay. Well, I have my own made up acronyms, we're going to keep that. Um, but we're also doing a lot more with the kind of smaller clients too. So I'd mentioned the soccer team, there's mm. a cosmetics company that we're starting to do some work with. So. You know, my goal is to make sure that we're doing the, the kind of the big scale stuff, but also to bring in because, clients on yeah. the kind of edgy side of things. Again, mm. really just trying to interest the team and what they're doing and what they're working mm. on, because I think there's sort of benefits you can learn from both. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy. Good, and again, thank you for inviting me to this lovely city. Uh, my pleasure. <laughs>